The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 76, to the chief musician on stringed instruments, a psalm of Asaph, a song. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the arrows of the bow, the shield and the sword of battle, Selah. You are more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted were plundered. They have sunk into their sleep, and none of the mighty men have found the use of their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse were cast into a dead sleep. You yourself are to be feared, and who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to judgment to deliver all the oppressed of the earth, Selah. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. With the remainder of wrath, you shall gird yourself. Make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Let all who are around him bring presents to him who ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is awesome to the kings of the earth. All right, we are starting chapter 21 of Judges. This is the last chapter of Judges. It's only going to be two sermons. This is part 10. Part 11 is next week. And um, I went over the final sermon in Judges this morning. Haven't gone over it in weeks and weeks, and I couldn't remember what I had typed. But um, the typology is going to be more confusing than most of the typology, um, simply because what's happening is there's no king in Israel. This is um, uh, 11 of these sermons. No king in Israel is speaking of the time of... Israel not acknowledging Jesus. Jesus is the king of Israel, but there is no king in Israel. Okay, so um, uh, the final part of it is pointing to the end times. And you will get the typology if you read it and think it through. But I just want you to know that it is a little more complicated than most of the other judges sermons that we have done. Okay, having said that, we are in Judges 21. <laughs> And we're going to read verses um, 1 through 19. It's a lot of verses, I know, but we'll get through it quickly. Now the men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mizpah, saying, None of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin as a wife. Then the people came to the house of God and remained there before God till evening. They lifted up their voices and wept bitterly and said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe missing in Israel? So it was on the next morning that the people rose early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. The children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly to the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who would not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. And the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin their brother and said, one tribe is cut off from Israel today. What shall we do for wives for those who remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives? And they said, What one is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come up to Mizpah to the Lord? And in fact, no one had come to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were counted, indeed, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. So the congregation sent out there 12,000 of their most valiant men and commanded them, saying, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children. And this is the thing that you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male and every woman who has known a man intimately. So they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately, and they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. Then the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin who were at the Rock of Ramon and announced peace to them. 
So Benjamin came back at that time and they gave them the women whom they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead, and yet they had not found enough for them. And the people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a void in the tribes of Israel. Then the elders of the congregation said, what shall we do for wives for those who remain since the women of Benjamin have been destroyed? And they said, there must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin that a tribe may not be destroyed from Israel. However, we cannot give them wives from our daughters for the children of Israel have sworn an oath saying, cursed be the one who gives a wife to Benjamin. Then they said, in fact, there is a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Labona. Okay, uh, before we get into these verses, I'll say that a lot of these verses were not well translated by the New King James Version. You're going to see that. And so you get kind of a false sense of what is going on in the passage. But uh, this is Judges 21, 1 through 19. It's entitled, No King in Israel, Part 10. This was typed on 29 July of 2024. The narrative in Judges 21 brings in a point of doctrine that seems to escape a surprisingly large portion of the church. It is such a critical point to understand that in misunderstanding the precept, it has brought in some of the nuttiest thinking imaginable to various denominations, sects, and cults. Benjamin has been reduced from a number of 26,700 fighting men, plus women, children, and the aged, to only 600 men. So, here's a question for you. Does the tribe of Benjamin still exist after the battle? It would be hard to find a single person who would say, no, Benjamin no longer exists. Until those 600 died, Benjamin would still be a tribe. But what if the number was only 120? Would Benjamin still exist? Again, the answer is affirmative. But what if there were only 17? or eight, or two, the answer would remain the same. Even if only one man of Benjamin survived, the tribe would still be considered a tribe. How many Benjamins were there that Jacob had as sons? How many? He had one son named Benjamin. He is the tribe. If there's one person in the tribe of Benjamin after him, it is still the tribe of Benjamin. That's, you can think of that and it'll help you. This is understood in the world today. A couple times in my life, I have heard of someone thought to be the last remaining person of a particular tribe of people, like the Eskimos, for example. When that person dies, that particular tribe dies out. Until then, the tribe remains. And this is true with languages as well. I knew a, didn't personally, but I knew of a Eskimo woman who was the last person that spoke her tribal dialect on the planet. And when she died, that language died with her. So as long as there's one survivor, the tribe remains, okay? Our text verse comes from Philippians 3. It is verses 4 through 6. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Now, this is Paul writing. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. The Apostle Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin. So, applying the logic, did the tribe of Benjamin exist at the time of Paul? Obviously. Even if Paul was the only Benjamite left, which he wasn't, the tribe would still exist until he died. In Luke 2.36, a woman of Asher, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, is named. Thus, Asher remained. In fact, after the exile of the ten northern tribes of Israel by Sennacherib, king of Assyria, members of almost every single tribe in Israel are mentioned after that. In other words, even though the majority of the tribe was exiled and their land inheritance was lost, there were still people from those tribes residing in the southern area of Judah. That fact continued on through the time of the apostles. In Acts 26, verse 7, Paul said, To this promise, our twelve tribes 
earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Likewise, the book of James is written to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Despite the exile, there were no lost tribes. And yet, denominations, sects, and cults within the supposed Christian church claim that they comprise the gathered lost tribes of Israel. This is true of British Israelianism, the Worldwide Church of God, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses in one respect, and others. They all claim something that they are not, and they base it on a faulty understanding of Scripture. Benjamin did not die out at the time of Judges, despite what took place in Judges chapter 20. And none of the tribes of Israel died out at the exile of the ten northern tribes. They continued on through the time of Jesus and the apostles, and they are being regathered to the land of Israel today. A good life lesson for the church would be to stop co-opting things belonging to Israel to which it has no right. If one wonders why there is so much disunity in the church today, it is because people fail to read the Bible, and even when they do, they take much of it out of its proper context. Don't do this. Great and reliable truths such as this are to be found in his superior word. And so let us turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I've got a couple of thoughts for you today. Actually, it might be three. But the first is, what shall we do? It's verses 1 through 7. Chapter 20 ended with the total defeat of the army of Benjamin and the complete destruction of the tribe and all its people. The only exception was noted in the final verses saying, from Judges 20, 47 and 48, but the 600 men had turned and fled toward the wilderness to the Rock of Ramon, and they stayed at the Rock of Ramon for four months. And the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin and struck them down with the edge of the sword. From every city, men and beasts, all who were found, they also set fire to all the cities they came to. With that remembered, we now enter into the contents of the final chapter of the book of Judges. Verse 1, now the men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mizpah, saying, Ve'ish Yisrael nishba ba'mitzpah lemor. And man Israel sworn in the Mizpah to say. In this chapter, it is apparent that there are two oaths that had previously been made by the congregation at Mizpah, but which had not been recorded. These oaths form the underlying structure of what will be recorded throughout this chapter. The first of these two oaths is next noted. Verse 1 continues, None of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin as a wife. Man from us not gives his daughter to Benjamin to wife. The oath was fortunately not one of harem, the total devotion of the tribe to God. If that were the case, the 600 at the Rock of Ramon would have been hunted down and they would have been killed as well. However, the people made an oath that Benjamin was cut off from marriage rights among the tribes of Israel at least at this time. Of this practice, John Lang provides an explanation from history. He says, they abrogated the connubium, the right of intermarriage within the tribe. They determined to treat Benjamin as a heathen people or as heathen nations in the absence of special treaties, which is epigamia, were accustomed to look upon each other. There were instances of heathen tribes who did not at all intermix such cases were found among the Germanic tribes also, until Christianity had fully conquered them. It was the church that brought East Goths and West Goths, Anglo-Saxons and Britons, Franks and Romans, to look upon each other as tribes of one Israel. Very great, therefore, must have been the indignation of the collective Israel when they thus, as it were, cast Benjamin out of their marriage covenant. The oath was made and it could not be taken back. As such, it has left Israel with a problem because they had killed all of the women and children of Benjamin. This left these 600 men without any ability to continue the existence of the tribe beyond themselves. Israel means he strives with God. The Mizpah means the watchtower. 
Benjamin means son of the right hand. Verse 2, then the people came to the house of God and remained there before God till evening. They lifted up their voices and wept bitterly. Vayavo ha'am betel, vayeshvu sham ad ha'erev lifne ha'elohim, vayisu kolam vayivku bechi gadol. And comes the people, Bethel, and sit there until the evening to faces the God and lift their voice and weep, ululation whopping. Here it says the people. Thus it is inclusive of soldiers, men, women, and children. Everybody is there. The people came out collectively to Bethel and spent the entire day there before the God, meaning the one true God, among those who are in a right relationship with him. Of this, the meaning is that the ark was still there after the battle as it was in Judges 20, verse 27. This time before the Lord was one of mourning and sadness. First, the verb is baka, to weep. That is enhanced by the next word, the noun bechi, which is a weeping. Such a weeping, when it involves an entire congregation, has a lot of noise and emotion. Thus, the word ululation fits perfectly. It has a particular onomatopoetic quality that matches the Mideastern weeping expressed here, where they go, Along with this ululating, there are deep searchings of heart and questions to God. Verse 3, and said, O Lord God of Israel, why is this come to pass in Israel? Rather, it says, Vayomru lama Yehovah Elohei Yisrael, haita zot be Yisrael, and say, why Yehovah God Israel came this in Israel? Of these words, Adam Clark incorrectly says, this was a very impertinent question. They knew well enough how it came to pass. It was right that the men of Gibeah should be punished, and it was right that they who vindicated them should share in that punishment. But they carried their revenge too far. They endeavored to exterminate both man and beast. However, they did exactly as the law stipulated. They eradicated the evil from Israel. There was nothing unjust in their actions, and there was nothing rude in the question. The Lord directed the battles. He oversaw the events, and he knew what the outcome would be. The question isn't why the battle took place or came out as it did. Instead, the question involves national integrity. Verse 3 continues that today there should be one tribe missing in Israel. The words are a sloppy paraphrase. It says, Le hipaked hayom mi Yisrael shevet echad, to visit the day from Israel, tribe one. The word is pakad, it means to visit. It is one of the most widely translated and applied words in the Bible, and each instance has to be considered from the context to understand the word's signification. Okay, some people are so confused with this word that they don't even know how to translate certain verses. They just pick something and shove it in there. It is a very difficult word because of the amount of possibilities that it could be. When you visit somebody, what does that mean? God visits you in judgment. God visits you through counting the numbers of the people, etc. So you have to have an underlying meaning of this word. In this case, the visitation means in judgment leading to near eradication. It cannot mean one tribe missing in Israel, as translated by many translations, because the one tribe still exists, even if in a completely degraded and seemingly hopeless cut-off state. Benjamin was visited, and the concern is that he will check out of the tribal enumeration at some point in the future. The triple repetition of the name Israel in this one verse stresses the matter in a unique and forceful way that reveals the utter astonishment and confusion in the minds of the people. They were a unified whole being the 12 sons of Israel. But more than that, this unity was under the headship of the Lord. The covenant cut with them and the promises made to them were of a national nature. This is important. This is what's going on in their minds right now. It is inclusive of all the tribes. If Benjamin were to be lost entirely, how would that affect the covenant promises and their national identity? This is what's on their minds. The Lord had covenanted with the 12 tribes at Sinai in Exodus 24. Later in Leviticus 26, he affirmed that they would be kept as a people. 
noting that even in the distant future, he would be their God. Here's what it says. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. The sorrow and confusion among the people would be great. How could the words of the covenant be true if Benjamin was set to perish? Therefore, the people come before the Lord in a hope of resolution. Verse 4, so it was on the next morning that the people rose early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And is from Maro and arose early the people and build their altar and ascend burnt offerings and peace offerings. These words show with all certainty that the translation of some versions as house of God instead of Bethel that we went through again and again last week is incorrect. If Israel had appeared before the house of God in Shiloh, they would not need to build an altar. Rather, the ark had been brought to Bethel, meaning house of God, while the rest of the tabernacle remained at Shiloh. Therefore, the people built an altar according to the law of the altar found in Exodus 20, verses 24 through 26. Once it was built, then the offerings could be presented. The burnt offerings are those wholly burnt to Jehovah as a sign of complete submission or dedication to him. The peace offerings had a sacred portion removed for the Lord according to the written law, and the rest was eaten by the people. It's kind of like our communion that we take every week. As such, the burnt offerings are for restoration from sin, and the peace offerings are a sign of renewed fellowship based on that restoration. After these were offered in the presence of the Lord, the second oath that had been made but was not previously recorded is next detailed. Verse 5, the children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly to the Lord? Vayomru b'nei Yisrael, mi asher lo ala vakahal mikal shivte Yisrael el Yehovah. And say, sons Israel, who which not ascended in the assembly from all tribes Israel unto Jehovah. A head count was taken in order for Israel to fulfill an oath that was previously made. This timing of this assembly had to have been at the time of Judges 20 verses 1 through 3. That is the only time that Mizpah is mentioned in the narrative until this chapter. But that is what is next referred to. Verse 5 continues, For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who had not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. Ki hashvua ha haita la asher lo ala el Yehovah ha mitzpah lemor mot yumat. For the oath, the whopping, made to which not ascended unto Yehovah the Mizpah to say, Dying shall die. When the assembly was called, it was a matter of national concern. Benjamin had to be dealt with. Any who did not come up would thus be considered as allying with Benjamin. Therefore, as was done to Benjamin, was to be done to them. That vow was put on hold while the matter of Benjamin was dealt with. One can see that verse 5 follows chronologically after verses 6 and 7 but it is placed here to reveal the genesis of the process that would lead to the restoration of the tribe of Benjamin. As such, verses 6 and 7 should be considered parenthetical. One can see this if verses 5 and 6 are reversed, and I'm going to do that, not trying to change the Word of God. I'm just showing you the logical progression. Here's what it would read like. Verse 4, starting at verse 4. So it was on the next morning that the people rose early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And, verse 6, the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin their brother and said, One tribe is cut off from Israel today. Verse 7, What shall we do for wives for those who remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives? Now back to verse 5. The children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly to the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who had not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. And they said, What one is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come up to Mizpah to the Lord? 
And in fact, no one had come up to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. So the best way to fix this isn't changing the verses. It's simply making the two previous verses parenthetical. Okay, verse 6. And the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin, their brother. Va'yinachamu b'nei Yisrael el binyamin achiv. And Sai, sons Israel, unto Benjamin, his brother. The word Naham is variously translated in this verse as repent, lament, grieve, feel sorry, etc. It comes from a primitive root signifying to sigh as one breathes heavily. One can see the people with their heads down, worn out from their ululating, and simply sighing in anguish. It appears as if there is no hope for Benjamin, and thus they continue with mournful words. Verse 6 continues and said, one tribe is cut off from Israel today. Vayomru nigda hayom shevet echad mi Yisrael. And say, hewn the day, tribe one, from Israel. The words show that the earlier translation of the New King James Version that the tribe was missing is incorrect. The tribe exists, but it is hewn away from Israel, cut off from any discernible future because of their weakened state and the oath concerning wives. Verse 7, what shall we do for wives for those who remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives? Ma na'ase lachem la notorim le nashim, va'anachnu nishbanu be Yehovah le bilti tet lachem mib notenu le nashim, and do to them, to the remainings, to wives. And we sworn in Yehovah to exception to give to them from our daughters to wives. Benjamin exists, but only as the remainings. They are a shadowy remnant of the tribe. And with the oath sworn in Jehovah, those who gathered could not go back on their word. And more, this was to exception, le bilti. It was a united and universal proclamation that their daughters were not to be given to Benjamin as wives. However, as it is said, necessity is the mother of invention. There is a need and a light bulb of inspiration comes on in the minds of the people. It is where verse 5 logically follows chronologically. The children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly to the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who would not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. 400 young virgins for 600 men. It ain't enough to give to all. So you'll need to plan again before you have that 600 couple wedding ball. But it will come about for sure because there is no lack in the Lord's plan. Trust him. He has the cure to take care of every man. The Lord is faithful and it will come to pass and a good end will be the result. For every man, a lovely lass because his plan is without fault. Our second thought today is 400 young virgins. It's verses 8 through 14. Verse 8, And they said, What one is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come up to Mizpah to the Lord? And in fact, no one had come to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. Vayomru mi echad mi shivte Yisrael asher lo ala el Yehovah ha mitzpah vehine lo ba ish el hamachane mi avesh gilad el hakahal and say who won from tribes Israel which no ascended unto Yehovah the Mizpah and behold no came man unto the camp from Jabesh Gilead unto the assembly two stones can be overturned at one time the people have made an oath that anyone who didn't come up to the assembly was to be put to death However, this was not a harem or a total devotion to the Lord. If it was, it would include the entire family along with all of their possessions. Rather, it was a call for the fighting men to assemble, as is evidenced in Judges 20. <coughs> and more, as these men didn't come out, they did not participate in the oath concerning the giving of daughters. As such, they will relinquish their lives while implicitly giving their daughters. The name Javesh or Yavesh comes from the verb Yavesh meaning to be dry, dried up or withered. It is used in the drying up of a river, land, bones and so forth. It is also used of the withering of grass. 
Thus, Jabesh Gilead means something like dry or drying perpetual fountain or withered or withering perpetual fountain. You have to ask yourself, why would something be named dried perpetual fountain unless it's giving us typology? Its location is east of the Jordan in the tribal allotment of Manasseh. Verse 9, for when the people were counted, indeed, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. And visits the people. And behold, not their man from inhabitings Jabesh Gilead. To visit here means to review them for a full census as you would when counting an army. In this action, they found that sure enough, Jabesh Gilead failed to come up and prepare for the battle against Benjamin. Once again, that word paked or pakad, visit, is the same one that was used earlier. The context has to be determined. It's a very hard word to understand what is being conveyed. You have to pay attention when you're looking at certain words in the Hebrew. Anyway, as such, it is as if they had allied with Benjamin against Israel. This will become a part of the solution to the dilemma faced by the collective nation. Verse 10, so the congregation sent out their 12,000 of their most valiant men. And send there the congregation to 10,000 men from sons the valor. The Latin Vulgate says 10,000. This was probably to avoid a difficulty based on the assumption that there were 1,000 drawn off from each tribe. But does the text say anything about drawing 1,000 off from each tribe? No. People make assumptions and then they make incorrect translations. If so, with Levi and Benjamin excluded, it would leave 10 or 11 tribes, depending on whether Joseph was reckoned as one or if Ephraim and Manasseh were counted separately. But nothing is said of a set number from each tribe. It appears that they simply mustered 12,000 out of the hole for the battle ahead. The number 12,000 is derived from 12, which is perfection of government or governmental perfection, and the number 10, completeness of order, where the whole cycle is complete. Verse 10 continues, and commanded them, saying, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children. Vaitsavu otam lemor lechu ve and command them to say, walk and struck inhabitants Jabesh Gilead to mouth sword and the women and the children. There was to be a complete eradication of those in the city by the cherev or the sword. However, one exception is to be made, which is implicitly stated next, verse 11. And this is the thing you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male and every woman who has not known a man intimately. And this the word which doing, all male and all woman knowing bed male anathematize. Because of what happened with Midian before entering Canaan, there was no need for the explicit command to retain the living females. This is the same generation that had heard the words of Moses from Numbers 31. And Moses said to them, Have you kept all the women alive? Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Blaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has not known a man intimately. But keep alive for yourselves all the young girls who have not known a man intimately. So they don't need to say it here because it's already understood in the collective mind of Israel. The harem or anathematized of the inhabitants was similar to an offering to the Lord. The virgins are to be accepted so that they can be presented as an offering to Benjamin a tribe of the Lord's people. Verse 12, So they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately. Vayimtsu mi yovoshve yavesh gilad arba meot na'ara vetula asher lo yada ish lemishkav zachar 
and find from inhabiting Jabesh Gilead 400 damsel, virgin, who not known man to bed male. The number of dead is unimportant to the narrative, and so it is excluded. However, the number of virgins is significant and is thus given. It is a derivative of four, the number of creation and the world and city number, and 10, which was just explained. It is also a derivative of 40 and 10. 40 is described by Bullinger. He says it is the product of five and eight and points to the action of grace, five, leading to and ending in revival and renewal, eight. This is certainly the case where 40 relates to a period of evident probation, but where it relates to enlarged dominion or to renewed or extended rule, then it does so in virtue of its factors four and 10 and in harmony with their signification. Verse 12 continues, and they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. If this is referring to the virgins, as seems natural, there is a gender discord because the pronoun is masculine. Vayaviu otam el hamachane Shiloh asher be'eretz kanan. And bring them, masculine plural, unto the camp Shiloh, which in land Canaan. Before I go on, if you don't understand what a gender discord is, it would be like me saying, uh, my brother is a great guy. She is uh, always helping people. That's a gender discord. It's saying something that doesn't make any sense. The book of Ruth is filled with these, and every one of them has meaning. Every one of them explains something in the redemptive narrative. If you've never seen the Ruth sermons, go watch them. You'll learn all about gender discords and why God uses them right in his words, as he is right here. That this is referring to the virgins is more definitively supported by the words of verse 22, which will be seen when we get there. The main camp of Israel is in Shiloh. With the war ending, that is where Phineas and the ark would return. The girls would be brought there until they were given in marriage to one of the Benjamites. Shiloh means tranquility. Canaan signifies humbled, humiliated, or even subdued. Verse 13, then the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin who were at the rock of Ramon and announced peace to them. And send all the congregation and word unto sons Benjamin who in Sela Ramon and call to them peace. This means that the representative elders of each tribe went as a delegation to meet Benjamin or a messenger went carrying the words of approval from all of the elders. The time of warfare is over and a guarantee of shalom or peace is granted to the remnant of the tribe. Ramon means pomegranate, but the pomegranate symbolizes harvest ready fruit. And so it can further mean mature mind or harvest ready. The type of rock is a selah, a craggy rock. That word comes from a root signifying to be lofty. Verse 14, so Benjamin came back at that time and they gave them the women whom they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead. Vayashav binyamin ba'et hahi vayitnu lahem hanashim asher hiyu minshe yavesh gilad. And returns Benjamin in the time the it, and give to them the women who lived from women Jabesh Gilead. The offer of peace would not be considered a ruse. If Israel wanted 400 from Benjamin dead, they would have simply sent the entire army and wiped them all out. So it's obviously not a ruse. They know that they are serious. Rather, it was understood as a binding offer of peace. As a bonus for the process of reconciliation, the damsels kept at Shiloh would be presented to the men. From this, it would be understood that a full state of harmony between the tribes was reestablished. Now, what do you think this is picturing? Think of the end times. Think of everything we've seen in these No Kings in Israel sermons. And what is this picturing? Okay, just keep thinking. You might get it before next week. Verse 14 continues. And yet they had not found enough for them. The words are intentionally sparse to highlight the lack. Velo matsu lahem ken, and not found to them thus. 
Despite having obtained 400 virgins, they realized they had not found enough wives for all 600 of the men of Benjamin. As such, there is a lack that will leave 200 unmarried. So there needs to be another way of obtaining wives for those still without. In the short term, we'll go on in part three in a second. But for now, no tribe will be rubbed out of Israel. The Lord is covenanted with them forever. And the faithfulness of the Lord, we can tell, because he will never fail. No, not ever. The Lord's promises are sure and true. They can be relied upon without any doubt. When they apply personally to me or you, trust them. You are dealing with the Lord's clout. When he says that you are saved, why would you ever question it is so? The road to glory he has paved through faith in Christ. That's all you need to know. Our third thought today is a yearly festival to the Lord. It is verses 15 through 19. Verse 15, and the people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a void in the tribes of Israel. Rather, veha'am nicham le vinyamin ki asa Yehovah peretz beshivte Yisrael. And the people sighed to Benjamin, for made Yehovah breach in tribes Israel. One can see the people, once they realized that there were more men of Benjamin than available women they had gathered for them, looking in the eyes of the other 200, looking away and sighing. It is not so much a void in Israel, but a breach. It is as if a dam is cracked and a certain amount of one of the tribes is being lost downstream. Even if the dam can be repaired, the lost water cannot be retrieved. This is the thought which is on the minds of the people. Verse 16, then the elders of the congregation said, what shall we do for wives for those who remain since the women of Benjamin have been destroyed? This is probably not a question at all, but an assertion. And say, elders, the congregation, what do to the remainings to wives for destroyed from Benjamin women? There is a conundrum. It is apparent that they had promised wives to the men in their offer of peace. However, the supply did not meet the demand. As such, they state where women can be obtained from and how it will be done. All the women of Benjamin were dead. And the virgins of Jabesh Gilead, the only group who did not show up as mandated, were insufficient. It appears impossible, but a solution is available. Verse 17, and they said there must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin, that a tribe may not be destroyed from Israel. The words are difficult and widely debated. Vayomru Yerushat Pelita le vinyamin velo yimache shevet mi Yisrael and say possession deliverance to Benjamin and not rubbed tribe from Israel. No matter how they are translated, they require insertions or an explanation to be understood. The words could be, as the New King James Version indicates, an adamant assertion that there must be more women or the tribe will perish. But this would assume that they honestly believe the tribe could be lost over 200 men lacking wives. That seems unlikely. Ellicott and Kyle tie the possession to the land itself. For example, the tribal land of Benjamin shall remain an independent possession for the Benjamites who have escaped the massacre so that a tribe may not be destroyed out of Israel. What they're trying to tell you there is that they are saying that it is the land that's being spoken of. The land is saved for the people so that a tribe won't be lost out of Israel. That's their argument. Thus, they needed to find wives for the men. But that has nothing to do with the context. Absolutely nothing. And more. The land was given by the Lord to Benjamin. The other tribes of Israel had no right to withhold or grant it. Does everybody remember that from the Torah? The tribal land of inheritance belongs to that tribal land. The five daughters of, what's his name? Uh, Mala, Tura, Terza, Hogla, Milka, and uh, the five daughters of Zelophehad. They repeated that story again and again and again to make absolutely sure that everybody understood no portion of any tribe of land was ever to pass from one tribe to another. So it can't be what Kyle and uh, Ellicott were saying. Cambridge naturally says the text is corrupt, which is their default setting. 
rather than this being an adamant assertion that there must be more women or the tribe will perish, it seems more likely that this is an adamant assurance by the leaders that the tribe will not be rubbed out. It's not a question, it's a statement. There will be women, a possession, for those of Benjamin who were delivered, meaning a deliverance, and no tribe will be rubbed from Israel. Stop weeping. Lang agrees with this, and it makes the most sense based on simple logic, the progression of thought, and the minimally provided Hebrew. Understanding this, it next says, verse 18, however, we cannot give them wives from our daughters. The conjunction is simply and, but however would rightly explain the thought based on the emphatic we that follows. Ve'anachnu lo nuchal latet lahem nashim mibnotnu. And we not able to give to them wives from our daughters. The congregation has vowed that they will not give women to Benjamin. This was understood and it cannot be violated. Anyone who gave a daughter to a Benjamite would face the consequences, not just with Israel, against the Lord. That was said to confirm the oath and ensure the vow's validity. The reason for it is again reiterated and expanded on. Verse 18 continues, For the children of Israel have sworn an oath, saying, Cursed be the one who gives a wife to Benjamin. Kinishbu vene Israel le mor arur noten isha le vinyamin. Forsworn sons Israel to say, cursed giving wife to Benjamin. All in the congregation made an oath. The details were specific. Anyone giving a wife to Benjamin would be in violation of the oath, and a curse would be upon such a person. Despite this, verse 19, then they said, in fact, there is a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh. The name of the location here and in verse 21 is spelled without an H ending. Vayomru hine chag Yehova beshilo mi yamin yamima. And say, behold, feast Yehovah in Shiloh from days, days word. This confirms the thought that the previous words were an adamant assertion to alleviate the woes of those who were mourning. In other words, stop weeping. We have a plan. And here are the details. It is true that nobody can give away a daughter to Benjamin, but that is not necessary to repair the breach. They're making an assertion and they've already got the idea in their mind what they're going to do. That's what's going on here. It's typical cunning logic. Somebody has a conundrum and he comes up with something that's not really legal, but it's also not illegal. That's what's going on here. Um, By the way, um, before I go on, I said that it doesn't have the H on Shiloh here. Okay. The New King James Version added it, most translations do. And that's too bad because the H has meaning. We saw that in the previous chapter. We're going to see it again next week in the explanation. Why is the H missing from Shiloh? Okay, you got to ask yourself these questions. If you get a Bible that's properly translated, you say, why is it spelled that way? The Lord is sending us information through this beautiful, precious word. Anyway, the term from days is rightly paraphrased as yearly. There were three annual feasts. The next one was coming in the days ahead, meaning day's word. And a solution to the problem rested there. The ingenious cunning of the plan will be laid out with intricate detail. For now, verse 19 finishes with, which is north of Bethel on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Lebona. Asher mitzvona le Bethel mizracha hashemesh. Le Limsila Haola mi bet el Shechma u mi negev lilvona, which from northward to Bethel, from ascension word the sun, to highway the ascending, from Bethel Shechem word, and from south to Labona. Can anybody tell me why they need that much explanation of where Shiloh is? It's, uh, you tell me. Well, we'll talk about it next week. Of the words, Ellicott rightly says, this elaborate description of the site of Shiloh, a place which is so often mentioned elsewhere without any addition, is extremely curious. Right? I mean, Shiloh's been mentioned a million times. Everybody knew where Shiloh was. That's where the tabernacle was. When you went to a feast of the Lord, you went to Shiloh. The whole country knew that. So why is it going through all this information telling us this? Unless God is giving us information in typology, it doesn't make any sense. Some scholars say the words are a gloss. Others say the elders were being very precise so that Benjamin would know exactly where Shiloh was. 
but that makes no sense at all. If this is where the annual pilgrim feasts were, everyone in the entire country would know exactly where Shiloh was. Instead, it appears that these words are an explanatory parenthesis by the author, not a description by the elders. The location of the Ark of the Covenant had changed by the time that Samuel, if he is the chronicler, which it's generally accepted he is, compiled the narrative. Therefore, he is describing under inspiration the layout of the land for the reader. Safona means northward, coming from Safon, the word north. North is the hidden direction in the northern hemisphere, where the sun moves toward or away from it, depending on the time of the year. If you don't believe that, just come out to my house, and every morning you'll see the sun going a little farther south every single day. And pretty soon it's going to be way down there. And when it comes up, the north is going to be dark. It's the hidden direction in the northern hemisphere. Okay, Thus the word signifies concealed. Mizraha signifies eastward, coming from Zarach to rise or come forth. Think of the sun coming up. Shechem means the neck between the shoulders. Thus, it literally means shoulder or back. But that comes from Shechem to start or rise early. So it gives the sense of responsibility, but specifically having a sense of responsibility as in personal interest. Why? Because I get up early to do my job, right? I have a sense of responsibility, whereas the sluggard stays in bed and he turns on the bed all day long. Okay, that's where the idea comes from. The south, the Negev, signifies parched. Lebona is found only here in scripture. It comes from the verb laven, to be white and to make bricks. Thus, it literally means white or frankincense, which is white, but the word laven has consistently been used in Scripture all the way since early Genesis to describe works, as in man's works, because bricks turn white when they are fired, but bricks are the works of men's hands. God made the stones, man makes the bricks, man makes the tower, God's divides the people, right? It's works going against the grace of God. That is the end of our review today. We covered a lot of verses and a great deal of information, but it is time to stop and finish both the chapter and the book of Judges next week. A key lesson that can be discovered in so many commentaries on verses like these is that the Bible is to be taken literally and in its proper context. We are not to appropriate things from Scripture or apply them to ourselves if we do not know what the subject matter is dealing with. Obviously, in typology, we may find useful applications in our lives, but despite this, in a clear reading of the Bible, we can easily see that the church has not replaced Israel, and those in the church are not spiritual Israel or the ten supposedly lost tribes of Israel. And more, we need more than our subjective opinion that the text has been manipulated, added to, or is missing something. Unless there is objective evidence of this, we should never make such claims. Just because we don't understand what is going on does not mean that the context and the content is in question. It may just mean we have no idea what is being conveyed for one of various reasons. Next week, we will go over the typology of the chapter. When we do, if the typology matches the narrative, then all of the commentaries that say that the text is in question are wrong. Everybody see that? Oh, well, this can't be right, or this is a gloss, or this is, you know, it can't be. If the typology matches, then the words are exactly as God wanted them to be. Exactly, including the missing H on Shiloh, etc. Rather, we should give the word the benefit of the doubt, trusting that it is reliable. Only with valid evidence that there is a question should we then search out that avenue. Let us hold fast to the word and cherish it as the most valuable treasure. Why? Because it is. This is the word of God. It is how God has communicated to his people. He's done it through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through holy men of God, and he has given us a word that is reliable and that will lead us to an understanding of what he expects of us, what he is like. All the theology in the world can be summed up right here in this book. All of the analysis of thousands of years of historians and theologians and people of the church are summed up in this book. 
Everything that they have looked at, if it is of value, comes from this book. God has given us this so that we can understand him. Please read this book. Cherish it. Don't malign it. Don't think that you're smarter than it. We will be getting information out of this book forever. It is marvelous what God has done. It is just unbelievable. Precious, precious word of God. Um, before we close, I'd like to make sure that anybody online um, is aware that uh, without Jesus, which this book explains, he says it himself. He says that, uh, you know, you search the scriptures, but they're, they're what testify of me, okay? You're looking for eternal life. It's right here. It's found in me. All right, that's Charlie Garrett paraphrase, but he's telling you that Moses and everybody afterward was writing about him. If you want eternal life, if you want to see the face of God someday, you're going to have to do it in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one that makes God knowable. He is the one that makes God understandable. And he is the only way to be reconciled to the God that we cannot see, the God that is spirit, that created all things, and that moves over his creation. Jesus is the answer to that. He died for your sins, implying that you're a sinner. You've offended a holy God. Jesus came to take care of that. He became our substitute so that we can have reconciliation with God. He was buried, taking your sin into the grave with him, and then he rose again, proving that he was without sin. Because if he had sin in his life, he would not have come out of the grave. And secondly, proving that your sin remains in the grave. Because if your sin stuck to him, he wouldn't have come out of the grave. And what does that prove? It proves that he is God. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And so I would ask that you would call on Jesus today, understanding that he is the one that can reconcile us back to the Father. Okay, please do that. Our closing verse comes from Psalm 68, it's verses 26 and 27. Bless God in the congregations, the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin, their leader, the princes of Judah and their company, the princes of Zebulun and the princes of Naphtali. Benjamin survived up until the time of the psalmist. He survived until the time of Paul, and he survives today And however God has enumerated his people. There are no lost tribes of Israel. Next week is Judges 21, 20 through 25. What a great story it has been to tell like a slice of heaven. It's entitled, No King in Israel. Part 11. Thank you, Jay. That'll be our 58th and final Judges sermon. I always get weepy when we get to the end of a book because it's such a precious journey that we are on going through the pages of the Bible. It's just it's unbelievable. Genesis, I never thought we'd get out of Genesis. Next thing you know, we're in Deuteronomy, right? I mean, we're just moving along. It's a wonderful book he's given us, and it's so filled with his love for the people of the world. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. It is he who judges his people according to their deeds. So follow him, live for him, and trust him, and he will do marvelous things for you and through you, okay? Our, uh, oh, I got a question for you. Let's see. Um, well, Rhoda's not here, right? Okay, well, she'll get it at home. Is she online? Okay, well, if she's online, she'll get it. Um, several of you others will get it. If you read the Bible more than one time, you will get it. It's not a tough question. It came out of the easy file. Um, in the parable of the lost coin, how many coins did the woman have? Who said that? He was fast. He got it. Ten. All right. There were ten. She lost one. Okay. And so she says, come over and help me find my coin. And then what does she do when she finds it? She rejoices. Right? She got her coin. There are different views on what those ten coins signify. If you listen to sermons by preachers that give, you know, fluffy sermons, they'll give you one of those views. And uh, one of them is that it belonged as a part of her uh, wedding. And one of them is that it belonged as a part of, you know, her family line or, they, you know, all kinds of things. But um, I don't really trust sermons like that. Um, I'll do my own research and I'll find out someday when I get to that commentary. But, uh, you know, people make stuff up in sermons just to make people feel good and quite often has no basis in reality at all. Um, okay. Got a poem and we'll be done. No king in Israel, part 10. Now the men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mizpah, saying during this time of strife, none of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin as a wife. 
And then the people came to the house of God and remained before God till evening there. They lifted up their voices and wept bitterly and said, O Lord God of Israel, in their prayer, why is this in Israel come to pass? Do tell that today there should be one tribe missing in Israel. So it was on the next morning that the people rose early to make their profferings and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. The children of Israel said, who is there among the tribes of Israel? Speak the word who did not come up with the assembly to the Lord. For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who had not come up speaking their Sheboleth to the Lord at Mizpah saying, he shall surely be put to death. Then the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin, their brother, and said, one tribe is cut off from Israel today as a son taken from his mother. What shall we do for wives, for those who remain, who kept their lives, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives? And they said, what one is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come up to Mizpah to the Lord? Speak up, do tell. And in fact, no one had come and they should be trembly to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were counted during this affair, indeed, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. So the congregation sent out their 12,000 of their most valiant men and commanded them saying, go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children. <coughs> so they were relaying. And this is the thing you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male and every woman who is known a man intimately. Yes, every such female. So they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately. And they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, north of the Salt Sea. Then the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin who were at the Rock of Ramon and announced peace to them. So Benjamin came back at that time and they gave them the women whom they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead and they had not found enough for them, still missing 40 times five. Then the people grieved for Benjamin for a spell because the Lord had made a void in the tribes of Israel. Then the elders of the congregation said, what shall we do for wives to be deployed for those who remain since the women of Benjamin have been destroyed? Then they said, there must be an inheritance, so we tell, for the survivors of Benjamin, that a tribe may not be destroyed from Israel. However, we cannot give them wives from our daughters, for the children of Israel, to their chagrin, have sworn an oath, saying, Cursed be the one who gives a wife to Benjamin. Then they said, In fact, there is a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, hoorah, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Lebanon. Lord God, turn our hearts to be obedient to your word. Give us wisdom to be ever faithful to you. May we carefully heed each thing we have heard. Yes, Lord God, may our hearts be faithful and true, and we shall be content and satisfied in you alone. We will follow you as we sing our songs of praise. Hallelujah to you, to us your path you have shown. Hallelujah, we shall sing to you for all of our days. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the chance to come into your presence and to share in your word with people of God who revel in your word, who love this word, who want to know it and seek it out and search it out and to apply it to their lives. Thank you for such people, Lord. It's a wonderful gift that you've given us and it transcends all ages, all cultures. It, it's just a marvel that it fits into circumstances from people from Papua New Guinea to Quito, Ecuador and to Sarasota, Florida. It doesn't matter where we are, Lord, your word resonates with the human soul because it is your word. Thank you for it. And especially because it is what tells us of Jesus. Without Jesus, the word would make no sense and it would have no validity in our lives. But because of Jesus, everything makes sense. Thank you for Jesus, our Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's see here. Um, yeah. We get the instruction for the Lord's Supper. It comes directly from Scripture. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, Paul wrote these words based on what the Lord had told him. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. 
And he would have blessed this bread. He would have said a blessing that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. It was codified into the Jewish society. They would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed us as well. He would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGuffin. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. This one is done by a guy in Ireland. He does one for each of our sermons. So, yeah. Have you ever heard of Chuck Wilkinson? I have not. <coughs> Detroit artist. Oh. Very good. Wow, wow, wow. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. What's that number six mean? Uh, number of man, especially That's fallen correct. man. That's why we had to have next chapter. Because they had 400. They didn't have that's, They didn't have six. If they had 400, they'd go back to K again. Yeah, that's right. The body and the blood of God the Lord provides. Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. I never know. Don't care. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Keep my sister in your prayers. Okay. Oh, I better take one. Better take one. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Is next week the first? Yes. Are you going to? I okay. All right. I have to remember that. Okay. Oh, good. Please Thank do. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus.
abiding in the blood of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> I know that's important to you. <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord. Well, if you're going to do that, then I'll take it and recycle it. There we go. You know, it's a federal crime to mess with people's mail, so i got to hand it to you. Then it comes back to me, it's all, all taken care of. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Uh, this is whoever wants it, just dig in. And they had payday today. Buy one, get one free bags. These are great. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Thank you. That's, no, that's a Jesus cup. It's the overflowing one. Way too big. For you. Okay. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. You got it. You can know. Just put your hand under there. <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. That was three syllables. I'm telling you. Eleven. Eleven. <laughs> The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Thank you. It's what? Absolutely. Three syllables. It took a lot of effort. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, this just a little bit. I mean, this is a this is a very thin type of. Uh, Whatever oh, you call it. Tastes better. Huh? It's good, I know. It's got great taste. Mm -hmm. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And amen. Yes. Take that one right there. Poppy seeds. Wow. Mm, they're amazing. I don't know what it, it might be. I'm sure those are. They're very good. Whatever they are, they're tasty and delicious. And that'll be my lunch. Yeah, it's like Sunday lunch. On the way home, I always eat that. Okay, now don't forget, we've got a birthday coming up tomorrow, so everybody wish the birthday girl a happy birthday. And then next week will be the first week of the month, and Mary Lee will have a birthday cake. Does anybody here have a birthday in November? Anybody? we got a November birthday here. Anybody else? Because we're going to be celebrating next week. All right, there we go. We got one at least. Um, let's see here, uh, November. Oh, I know. we got another November birthday coming up on 4 November. My granddaughter. 4 November will be one year old. I, yay, man. So she won't be here yet. She's coming on the 15th of November, but... I just saw somebody pointing. Is somebody back there got... Joan has a November birthday, and she's slinking down in her seat. Now, we don't slink here. This isn't a slink church. All right. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be in your presence. And uh, we just thank you for your kind hand upon us, even during the storms of the past month. We're looking forward to November and no storms at all. Uh, we're very grateful to you, whatever happens. We know that you're... We are yours because of Jesus, and because of that, we have a hope that just cannot be taken away from us, and help us to have the joy that goes along with that by simply focusing on you and understanding that no matter what happens, you are in control. We're grateful for that knowledge, and we just thank you. We're so grateful to you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.